Good morning. Good morning. Happy, New Year. Happy New Year. Go dogs. Go dogs. Made me a little nervous last night. I, I will admit, I actually went to sleep at halftime. But, I mean, I did. I, I just figured that I needed to be, like, nice and fresh and ready for the morning to preach to y'all. And then I woke up. It was like the Lord just said, waketh up. Right? I did. Right before Stetson threw that last touchdown pass. So I did see the last couple minutes, which was, which was nice. Um, before we dive into our text this morning, I do have some pretty incredible news for you this morning. Uh, Gavin and Catherine welcomed little Eden Mitchell into the world yesterday morning. So, yeah. <clears throat> So please um, be in prayer for them as they make adjustments to this new season in life. I will say, because I'll be in trouble if I don't say this, uh, she's six pounds, eight ounces, 20 inches long. For all of you ladies in here, like, I, I get it. I, Shannon's always like, well, how much baby weigh? How long was the baby? And I'm always like, I, I don't know. Yeah, so for all you ladies... Uh, yeah, there you go. But mom and baby and, and Gavin, they're all doing well. So again, please just continue to pray for them as they um, bring little baby home. Uh, let me pray real quick one more time. And as Pastor Nolan said, we are jumping back into the book of James this morning. We'll be in James chapter 1. We're just covering one verse. I'm not saying that that's going to only take 30 minutes, so bear with me. And uh, Lord willing, we will, we will get through it this morning. Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for the day. Father, thank you for uh, the opportunity that we have to gather together. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, as, as I studied this week, Lord... It, Father, it was just it's so encouraging, Father, that while we all go through trials and tribulations, Lord, that, that you are sovereign, that you do sit on your throne. Father, th- there's not a person that sits in this room at this moment that's here by accident. So, Father, I pray, Lord, I ask you that you would have your way amongst your people this morning. That you would speak through me, Father, that none of these words that come out of my mouth this morning are of me. We love you. Amen. So, the title of this morning's sermon is The Effects of Faith Enduring Temptation. And since we took a a little bit of a break for our Advent series, just to to recap some background information here, we know that the book of James was written by James, the half-brother of Jesus. The book's considered to be a general epistle. It's not written specifically or directly to a particular church. Audience that James wrote to is mainly Jewish believers. Many of them were in a very poor state and a a pretty tough, oppressed social situation. And as Pastor Nolan, as Pastor Nolan pointed out uh, earlier, James is, is a very practical book. And in it, we see 60 imperatives as we read and study throughout the book. So what I would like to do is, is because we've had a little bit of a break, let's read James 1, 1 through 11, And then we'll pick back up and and we'll cover verse 12. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 
But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and give, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory God in his high position. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man, in the midst of his pursuits, will fade away. So what, what we're about to see when we, when we come to, to verse 12 is James comes back to this idea of facing trials that he just talked about. We can almost take verse 12 as like the closing of a section, if you will, here. And he addresses the outcome of persevering under trial. This is what he wrote. He said, blessed Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And we see this correlation between this verse and then verses 3 and 4, right? Verse 3, we see the testing of faith produces endurance. Verse 12, we see perseveres under trial. Verse 4, let endurance have its perfect result. Verse 12, he will receive the crown of life. So he's wrapping things up here. But it's interesting that James doesn't give details about what these trials look like. He doesn't give us a list of of what they specifically look like. He, He simply says that we will encounter various trials. Not if, but when, like we will, which tells us that we shouldn't fall into the trap of, of believing the lie that if a person is a true believer, then he or she won't go through trials. Because nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. All of us face trials and difficulties. And these trials will continue so long as we are on this side of heaven. It just will. That's the reality for us. And James, what he teaches us here, it directly contradicts this false prosperity, health, and wealth gospel that's rampantly spreading. It goes directly against it. If anybody tells you that believers won't face trials, I would say to them, you need to go back and read the Word. Because we do. But I do think that there's a reason that James doesn't give us the specific list on what trials look like. Because they look different for each of us. Trials come at different times. We experience trials differently. But if we were to focus on what trials look like, it would take us away from the point that James is making here. And I hope that what we see this morning is that there is purpose in the trials that we face, and those who persevere under those trials will be blessed. There's purpose behind the trial, and those who persevere will be blessed. So in order to figure this out, we have to figure out, well, what is a trial? And I think to to put that very simply, Trials are circumstances in life that attempt to draw us away from our faith in Christ. I'll say that again. I think that's the best way to put it. Trials are just the circumstances in our life that attempt to draw us away from our faith in Jesus. It's those things that, that attempt to steal our joy. And when we hear that, we might think to ourselves, well, if that's the case, shouldn't we be doing everything we can possibly do to avoid those trials? 
Like if trials are, are, are an attempt to steal my joy, shouldn't I try to run away from those? Shouldn't I try to go under those or around those? But that's not what James teaches us here. It's, it's important to understand that some, not all, but some of the trials that we face will come as a result of our obedience to Jesus. Just think about that for a moment. There will be times of persecution because of our faith. You lose your job because of your faith. You get a bad grade from a college professor because of your faith. You could be shunned by your family because of your faith. We could die because of our faith. 1 Peter 3.14, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. There's still this blessing of persevering under trial. So some questions for us this morning. Just to think through, kind of have in the back of your mind as we go through this text. Number one, how do I view trials? How do I view the trials in my life? And then secondly, am I attempting to run away from or avoid trials? Now James doesn't, he doesn't tell us the goal is to avoid trials. It's clear here. The goal isn't to run away from trials. The goal is to persevere under trials. What a persevere in what? Persevere in faith. That's the goal here, to persevere in the faith. And thankfully, thankfully, we're not called to seek out trials on our own. That's a very important point. The Lord's not telling us, hey, go and seek out some trials so you can grow in your faith. Because we would mess that up. I would. I would for sure. But the Lord, in his perfect plan and in his perfect timing, orchestrates the trials in our lives as he sees fit. Now, real quick, I am not equating trials with temptation. We have to understand, I'm I'm not saying that trials are the same thing there. A trial is given for the purpose of examination. It's to learn a person's true nature. It's what trial does, and we'll get into that a little more. Temptation is given for the purpose of trying to make one sin. So we're not not tempted by God. And Lord willing, Pastor Nolan's going to cover that next week. But just understand that there's a difference. I'm I'm talking about trials, not temptation here. But before I give some practical things that we as believers do in order to persevere under trials, I need to be very clear about something. And I hope that it doesn't get confusing, but I think it's important to point out that it is the Lord. It is the Lord who keeps his saints. It is the Lord who causes his saints to persevere. Somebody say amen. Wake up, please. I need some help. It's late night. What? <laughs> I'm tired too. Help me out. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, But now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. And to make you stand in the presence of his glory. Blameless with great joy. 
to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. It is the Lord who keeps his saints through and under trials. Put it another way, I think. The way in which a person lives is determined by what a person loves. And that one stings a little bit. The way in which a person lives is determined by what a person loves. So it is because of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ that we persevere under trials. Our love for the Lord and trust in the Lord is what sees us through the trials that we go through. This means that trials ultimately reveal what we love. It's a purpose behind that. We think of Think of the parable of the sower, Matthew 13. So, so those who do not persevere under trial, those who do not finish the race and keep the faith to the end, are those seeds that fall beside the road. They are those seeds that fall on rocky places that did not have much soil at all. They are those seeds that fall among the thorns and are eventually choked out. But those who do persevere under trial, those who do finish the race, are the seeds that fall on good soil. It is those who have genuine saving faith in Christ. But at the same time, there's some practical things that we do as believers in order to persevere under trials. We pray. We have to be a praying people. Pray before the trial. You pray during the trial. You pray after the trial. We're in the Word. We're to preach the Word of God to ourselves daily. We should expect trials to come. Why do we expect trials to come? Because the Word of God that we preach to ourselves daily tells us that they will come. We are to be in constant fellowship with believers. And this goes beyond an hour and 30 minutes a week. And you might very well be saying, well, Pastor Stephen, hold on. Aren't you kind of contradicting what you said earlier? You said earlier that it's the Lord who keeps his saints. But now you're saying the saints have to do these things. Well, here's what I'm saying. Why do we pray? Because we love the Lord. Why do we study the word of God? Why do we meditate on God's word? Because we love God's word. Why do we fellowship with believers? Because we love one another. Why do we do all of these things? It is because of God's grace that we have been saved through faith. That's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Because God loved me first and called me to himself, I do these things out of my love for him. Brings us to my next point. There is purpose in the trials that we go through. There's purpose in the trials that we go through. Now, real quick, I, I think that it's, it's very important here that we not be deceived into thinking that all of the trials in which we encounter are full of pain and discomfort. Well, how is that? Aren't all trials full of pain and discomfort? Well, we have to remember what a trial is, right? It's those circumstances in our lives that attempt to draw us away from our faith in Jesus. See, a man in his riches, if he's not careful, will begin to focus and fall in love with gold and silver instead of Jesus probably doesn't feel like a trial at the time to him, but nonetheless, it's a trial. 
at times the very trial that we might face could be the, just like the comfort of everyday life. This comfort that kind of bids for a man to fall into this state of complacency. First Thessalonians 5, 4 and 6. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. So no matter if if you're in this time of life where it just seems like, hey, everything is going great. Or whether you're in this difficult time of life when when your thermostat says it's 47 in your house because your, your heat broke and you don't know how to fix it, whether you're in either of those situations, we are to run to Jesus in all things. But I, I do think that more often than not, the trials that we face, they are those things that are full of pain and hardship. I'll give you... A, an illustration, and I hope, I hope this helps. I'm going to ask Kevin to come up here. Yeah, I asked him to take his shoes off, so he didn't do that. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to need you to trust me. I need you to close your eyes. Just keep them closed. All right. Just imagine for a moment. There's this young boy. I'll be the young boy since I'm so young. And this young boy, he keeps tugging on his, on his older brother's shirt. He just wants some attention. I just wants you to play with me. I just want your attention. But to no avail. This older brother, he just, he just keeps ignoring his younger sibling. But being that his older brother is a typical teenager, this young little boy, he knows that he's going to sleep in on Saturday morning, and he's not going to get up to watch Saturday morning cartoons. So this young little boy, he comes up with a plan. And he woke up really early on Saturday. Took some Legos. And he spread them out on the floor in front of his big brother's door. Why? Because anybody and everybody in this room knows that stepping on a Lego is the worst pain ever. (laughs) But this young boy understands what he knows is that pain gets people's attention. So, brother, I'm just going to ask you to take a big step forward. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Don't do that. Don't do that. I appreciate you being up here. I'm not going to make you. Yeah, that would be bad. You might even say something like, hmm, appreciate you. But the point here is that that pain, discomfort, those things do get our attention. And often, The Lord uses those things in our lives to open our eyes up a little bit. Hey, it's me. Focus on me. See, trials, again, they are not outside of God's plan. He uses them for the process of sanctification. He uses them to help us grow and mature in the faith. But brothers and sisters, because we have experienced Jesus, and because we've been given faith to trust in his word, we face trials differently than the world does. We trust that the Lord is working all things for our good. We trust that his plan is perfect. We trust that he's working in everything to conform us to look more like his son. 
It's a promise of Romans 8, 28. We know that what? All things. God causes all things to work together for good to those who what? Love God. To those who are called according to His purpose. Lord uses these things. And because we've experienced Jesus, listen, brothers, this is we get to. We get to cry out to the Lord saying, Father, thank you for the trials in my life. We get to do that. Thank you for drawing me closer to you. Thank you for showing up once again. Thank you for showing yourself to others. Thank you for getting glory through all of this. And through this, we, what we see is that persevering under trials proves that our faith is real. It, it gives evidence to that. How can you know that your faith is genuine if it's never been tried? You can't. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that everybody in this room who's a disciple of Jesus can look back. And time after time after time again, the Lord has kept them through trials. 1 Peter 1, 6-7, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. Persevering through trials gives evidence of God's grace. Is evidence that he's working in us and through us. And brothers and sisters, the most important thing, the reason that you and I were created is to glorify God. Christ is glorified when his people persevere under trial. 1 Peter 5.10, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Persevering in the faith is relying on God through all of our circumstances. Every bit of them. So we come back to this first word in this verse. You're blessed. It's the state of having great joy. Blessed are those who persevere under trial. The same word was used by Jesus nine times in his Sermon on the Mount. It's characterized by happiness and and being highly favored as by divine grace. It is a joy and happiness that does not derive from material possessions or circumstances. This is why we can have joy in every circumstance that we go through. We are blessed while we are here on this side of heaven because of the process of sanctification and we are blessed that we get to suffer for the sake of the gospel. We are also blessed because of what we will receive. Brothers and sisters, the crown of life awaits all who endure to the end. Those who endure to the end will be saved. It's Matthew 24, 13. Those who persevere in the faith until the end will be approved. This is about finishing the race. This is about fighting the fight to the end. And don't miss this. This is very important. 
whatever trials you have gone through in the past, whatever trial you are currently in right now in this moment, or whatever trials you will come to face in the future, do not compare to the glory that is to come. Romans 8, 18 and 19, For consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy. They are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the ancient, anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. <laughs> Sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared to what is to come. As I close this morning, as I close this morning, I, I really, I want you to leave encouraged. Because I, I know some of you who are sitting in this room are, you're struggling a little bit. You're in a hard place. Some of you have just come out of that. Some of you are in that right now. It's a, it's a brand new year. Some, some of you are going to face some things this year. But hear this. In the deepest of valleys and the darkest of nights, know, know that you do not walk alone. Continue, continue to trust in the Word of God. Continue to trust in Jesus. Continue to fall on your knees. If you would, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke 22. Turn to Luke 22. And as you're doing that, if I'm going to ask the prayer team to, to go ahead and come up. Luke 22, 31. Would you listen to what Jesus says to Peter right here? Luke 22, 31. This is Jesus. This is what he says to Peter. Simon, Simon. Behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Now what's interesting here is the you in this verse is actually plural. This is about the disciples. Satan has demanded that he sift you like wheat. But then Jesus continues. And at this point, he, he directs his focus directly to Peter. And he said, but, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But see, just as Christ prayed, for, prayed that Peter's faith would not fail, he intercedes for you and for I. Not yesterday, or just the day before, but today as well. And he will till tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that. Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Our King and our Savior will not allow Satan to destroy or take away the faith that God has given us.
So stand firm. Fight the fight. Continue the race. Praise God in all things. So I want to take just some time this morning. Prayer team's up here. And and we're going to sing, but as we're doing so, if, if you need to come down and pray with somebody, Maybe you need to stay in your seat, have a time of reflection. Maybe it's just rough right now. Maybe it's rough and you just, you've just been running away or attempting to, and you're at this place where you just need to say, Father, I just, I'm sorry. I tried to do this on my own and it didn't work. Whatever it is, I I just, want us to take some time this morning just to go to the Father and to pray.